Let's start from the University of Cape Coast, where the branch of the Senior Staff Association of the Universities of Ghana has declared an indefinite strike over what they describe as ill practices meted out to their members. The group is asking for promotion of senior staff, appointment to senior membership, career progression, non-payment of negotiated allowances, and many more. There's more from this news conference in Cape Coast. As far back as May 2022, the association submitted eight grievances and concerns about some unfair and discriminatory practice being meted out to its members by the management of University of Cape Coast. At the news conference in Cape Coast, the chairman of the UCC branch of the Senior Staff Association, the Universities of Ghana, Sandy Kumi Sinatra, indicated the association had on several occasions sent constant reminders on these grievances and concerns to management, but the management of UCC has paid no heed to them. Sadly, he indicated the management was unable to provide relevant source documents to back these unfair practices being meted out against the senior staff cadre. Management has not acknowledged receipts of our correspondence or responded to same since 9th of August 2022. We find this unfortunate as as a managerial shenanigans to further aggravate the plight of the senior staff cadre. Ladies and gentlemen, is it a crime to be a senior staff in the University of Peoples? We further wish to express our utter disappointment in the University of Cape Coast Governing Council for failing to show concern to the issues submitted by the association. How is it possible for a council to approve a new rate for services being rendered by the university, including the UCC guest house in Accra, Tesano? Reviewed upwardly to 200, and 200 cities, and the same council then approved a night allowance of 180 cities for senior staff. This ridiculous decision is rather making us aliens in our own house. Oh. Are we then not justified to say the council is just a rubber stamp? Yeah. It is undoubtedly evident enough that UCC management is overstepping its boundaries as far as the labor law and conditions of service for the senior staff in the public universities are concerned. On this basis, we are of the strongest view that the government should intervene through the Ministry of Education, Ministry of Employment and Labor Relations, the National Labor Commission, since such acts by management are making the government unpopular among senior staff on UCC campus. Sandy Kumi Sinatra declared the strike starting Friday. Joint news checks indicated that all offices of the Senior Staff Association on campus were locked up, while the senior staff who were on campus were seen wearing red armbands. Now, some alumni of the Cape Coast Technical University won President Akufado to, as a matter of urgency, remove the council chairman of the institution. Uh, they say some of his actions could bring the university on its knees if he continued to stay in office. Emmanuel Kofi speaks for the group. We, the concerned members of Cape Coast Technical University alumni, Cape Coast, kindly bring to you your attention some development at the Cape Coast Technical University, which if not checked, could bring the university to its knees. This negative act are orchestrated by the council chairman, Professor Harold Amonu Kofi. Say, and point one, even though university council is to foster linkage and collaboration with relevant national and international industries and institutions 
in furtherance of the mission of the Technical University. This is not the case at Cape Coast Technical University, as the council chairman has demonstrated per his actions that he does not mean well for the university. He has virtually kicked against decisions that will speed up development and progress at Cape Coast Technical University. Indeed, since assuming office in 2017, he has not initiated any linkage, collaboration, or lobbied for any development project on campus. Point two, the university lacks hostel, accommodation, and well-equipped lecture halls, which are the main reasons for its low enrollment. In remedying this negative situation, the university engaged a number of private developers to assist in this regard. Such initiatives have not been rolled out as the council chairman has constantly frustrated the process. For instance, before the old council was dissolved, discussions with the private developer on strategic projects had gone far. The process continued even after the dissolution of the old council. Management engaged correspondences with the Ministry of Education and Finance for approval. The council chairman since has appointed his um, he has appointed the council chairman since, has, he, since his appointment has unilaterally stopped the project. Also, his actions has brought to a standstill a market project being founded by the Coastal Development Authority, CODA. The university demolished the only market facility on campus because it was poorly sited, hence impeding learning due to the noise from the market activities. Four, the chairman has again stopped the construction of a mall and fuel station, which the old council had approved and the initiative, but could not finalize the agreement before dissolution. Even though the current development subcommittee has reviewed the agreement favorably and recommended for approval, the chairman has again rejected it. He has failed to give direction on this matter, and the project has been at standstill since February 2022. Five, the, chairman, the council chairman has again been usurping the powers of management, and this has created a frosty, a frosty relationship between the chairman of the council on one side and the vice chancellor, pro-vice chancellor, the registrar on the other hand. The council chairman gives instructions to the vice chancellor through the registrar regarding the day-to-day regarding the -day running of the university. For example, he instructed the registrar to instruct the vice chancellor to call for academic board meeting just to, just to push his agenda through. Six, he has, he, has been, he has been nothing but divisive, dictatorial, and authoritative in pursuing a hidden agenda and also protecting his boy. Mr. Anthony H. Texan, who was CCTU Director of Human Resource, but now the Director of Public Affairs. Now, the Ministry of Fisheries and Aquaculture Development has announced the closed fishing season for both artisanal and industrial trawl fleet. The Ministry says canoe and inshore fishermen are to observe the closed season for the month of July, while the industrial trawlers will observe the close season for two months, July and August. Sector Minister Mavis Halkum Sin also implored the fisher folks to disregard politicians who are going around promising to cancel the close season should they win power. The closed season is one of the fisheries management plans rooted in Ghana's fisheries laws aimed at recovering the fishery stocks. According to the Ministry, adequate preparations have been done to ensure that implementation process becomes a success. Deputy Minister of Fisheries, Mosi Senim, read a ministry statement announcing the close season. I know that fishers are now relieved that the premix fuel distribution has resumed since March 2023 to keep the issues of middlemen, hoarding, and among other issues, I will be commissioning 20 of the completed premix automated outlets in different locations in the country. It is anticipated 
that by the end of the year, majority of the sites will have been completed and, dis and dispensing fuel. We have all discussed and agreed again today that any close season gains will not be realized if we all do not collectively combat IUU fishing activities. I want to thank our gallant fishers and development partners for our continuous support in implementing the close season and our stock recovery efforts. I am certain that if we continue this, if we continue for, for some time, we will reverse the dwindling trend of our fish stock. It is on this note that I hereby officially announce the 2023 close season. Canoe and inshore fishers will observe the close season from 1st to 31st July 2023. Industrial trawlers will also observe the close season from 1st July to 31st August 2023. Minister for Fisheries and Aquaculture Development, Mavis Howard Kumsin was a bit that should the fishing industry stick to the close season, the fishers themselves will reap the benefits of such an intervention. She warned the fishers to disregard the utterances of politicians who are going round to promise a cancellation of the fisheries management measure should they win power. Point of correction, not responding to. I didn't respond. I was only advising to the fishers that they should be mindful of we the politicians, that we always use them. I don't see a reason why a former president of Ghana will stand somewhere and say when he comes, he will cancel the close season. The close season is a law. It's backed by law. And so if you say you close it, then I beg to differ. He was the president of this country and under his watch, there was psycho in this country. And we have all cried on this psycho issue that the trawlers are killing our artisanal fishes. So if you want to stop the psycho, then first of all, you have to also stop the, 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 the artisanals also from doing their illegal activities. Then you can stop the industrial people. I mean, I wasn't responding to him. I was only trying to advise them. and also let them know they are rather benefiting from this close season more than any other person. Uh, government does not take, I mean, does not enjoy in spending so much in observing this close season. When we tell you the amount that is involved, you, you will realize that, well, it's not necessary for now. When the need comes, I'll let you know. The ministry revealed government was engaging Ghana's neighbors to entreat them to partake in the close season to ensure some maximum gains when seasons closes and opens. According to the ministry's report on last year's close season, there was an improvement in the stock of fish after the season and the fisher folk were generally excited at the development. Reporting for Joy News from Accra, Richard Kujunyako. Now, meanwhile, the Center for Coastal Management at the University of Cape Coast is calling for a coherent coastal management policy to address issues about economic activities that relate to the fishery sector. Speaking at the 10th anniversary of the Center, Director Professor Dennis Wolanyo Aheto indicated such a policy will manage and improve the fisheries resources of the country. Speaking at a ceremony to mark the 10th anniversary of the Center, for Coastal Management at the University of Cape Coast, Director of the Centre, Professor Dennis Wolanyo Aheto, stated how the close season, if properly observed, will inure to the benefit of Ghanaians. We need to accept it as a country because uh, it's not just happening in Ghana, it's a, it's a it's science based approach, you know, where uh, we close the sea for a season to allow the fish stock to breed. It's a management measure. It's just one of the management measures. Of course, there are other measures, which includes uh, closing the certain areas. It's not just closing the season. You may also decide to close certain areas or introduce quota systems, you know, and many other approaches. So Ghana has decided to engage on the close season, which is fine for industrial and artisanal uh, sector. Uh, but the major issue has not been so much with the industrial sector, but with the artisanal sector. 
because the timing uh, that the fishers want to do the fishing is usually different from what the science is saying. The science, uh, the closing the sea for small scale artisanal fishers targets the small pelagics, particularly the sardines, which breed at their peak season in August, which we, the scientists, have proposed to close the sea. Unfortunately, stakeholders and fishers think that it should be earlier, you know, which does not really coincide with the peak season, and that is really where the issue is. Uh, and I think that uh, so far the efforts that government put in place, um, I think we were able to have close seasons, even though we're not at the right timing. So we hope that it should be timed in a way that we don't do the wrong things and at the end of the day see our stocks all collapse. He also called for a coastal management policy for the country. Currently in Ghana we don't have, we don't have any straight jacket coastal management policy. All the policies are hedged in different uh, institutions. We, do not, we need to have a coherent coastal management policy for the country which will address in a concerted way uh, issues to do with the blue economy, referring to all the economic sectors, not just fisheries, but also all the economic activities, is salt production, energy, you know, mining and all that around, around and within coastal areas, you know, so that there's a strict jacketed policy, not hedged in the Ministry of Fisheries or Environment, but really a policy that speaks to how we manage our coast. And of, to date, we don't have anything like that. And I think you certainly need a policy with a legal backing that then streets, uh, feeds into a process, a management process. And we don't have that. And the Vice Chancellor of the University of Cape Coast, Professor Johnson Yakubuampo, applauded the management of the centre for the giant strides it has taken since its establishment. I want to use this opportunity to encourage other departments and centres in the university to emulate their worthy efforts especially in the area of craftsmanship, research, and partnerships. Finally, I wish to urge members of the university community to fully support the center and participate in the series of events lined up within the year for the celebration of the Dickers' achievements. The center is on, on the verge of entering into partnership with the European Union through the EU connects a strong partnership arrangement among nine universities in Europe. Now, Vice President at Imani Africa, Kofi Bento, is asking the National Peace Council to name and shame political actors who use intemperate language with the potential to disturb the peace of the country. Yeah, great minister, Brian Echampon, and former president, John Mahama, have been in the news this week over comments made believed to have the potential of inciting their followers to foment trouble. Speaking on Newsfile, Kofi Bento said the Peace Council has a major role to play in calling the two political parties to order. One speech alone is not, cannot be proven in a law court with evidence that it will lead to A, B, C, D, beyond reasonable doubt. If, however, a series of those speeches, or if they continue, if we don't condemn them and let them know that, look, we see through these things, we see through what you say, we see through what the party says, you actually annoy us. And I'm telling you, they've lost some independent votes by some of those things. But to run it through a criminal accusation process, prosecution, it doesn't rise to that. We'll send ourselves through unnecessary stress. What this has to be, how this has to be dealt with is with organizations like the Peace Council calling it out and I'm saying make a list of it, put it somewhere, let's have somewhere in the website people who will be listed as having dishonorably conducted themselves and having said things that were poor, bad, not in good taste and let us shame them. Now, if it continues, then we know what to do about it, but this alone. Now, a fellow at CDD, Dr. John Osai Kwapon, also called on the Peace Council to deepen its collaboration with the various political parties. I think the Peace Council, for example, can work with, you know, our major, uh, our major political parties. Yes, I'm sure the parties cannot, quote unquote, control what everybody is going to say at any given moment. But at least um, our favorite word in Ghana, you know, synthesize, right? You uh, uh, sensitize, right? You can find ways 
to continue having these regular dialogues with our key stakeholders in the electoral uh, in the electoral process to make sure that uh, you know they understand that it's our uh, elections are quote and quote not a matter of life and death right that if it's a matter of life and death it has to be more about the future of our country which direction do we want to take the country what kinds of policies do we want to to prevail right and in articulating and discussing and debating those we should also at the same time make sure that our, our, our temperament doesn't ratchet up the temperature over something that you know t- tends to generate um, a lot of heat but i think the peace council should Continue to find ways to work with um, uh, with our with with our key stakeholders. Now, some selected judges and members of civil society organisations have validated a Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative Right to Information Training Manual for judges in Ghana. The initiative says the efforts leading up to the passage of the Right to Information Law were marked by robust civil society advocacy, including engagement and lobbying of the legislature and the executive. Programs manager for the initiative, Esther Poku Eduhine, says the training manual will help apprise judges of both local and international dynamics of the law. The Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative, in partnership with the Coalition on the Right to Information and then the Judicial Training Institute, so it's necessary to come up with a, a guide, something like a guide mm. to be used to support the training of judges on the in- interpretation of the access to information law. Mm. Because, of course, when somebody is denied access and the person goes to, the, to court, the person is expecting that um, the person's rights will be adhered to or will be promoted. So what we are seeking to do is that, of course, we all know that the right to information is a constitutional right. It's already with, with or without a right to information law. It is a right, but this is also a part of part of a process to support the uh, implementation, to support, because we know that the, those um, who are supposed to make decisions when it comes to when somebody applies the law, also uh, need some technical support mm. to be able to make the right kind of decisions. They are international standard, they are international best practices. So we thought to put all this information together. And Ghana is not the only country that has taken this path. There are so many countries that have gone ahead of us mm when it comes to uh, right to information. So we thought it right that we will gather evidence from other jurisdictions when it comes to um, court decisions, mm. court decisions on RTI, what does it take, what does it mean, what are, what are they saying on other jurisdictions, just to guide us so that it means that for us we are even um, we are in the safe hands because we have the, we have the room to learn mm. from other countries, the best practices. We have the room to t- adopt those that are good and then also manage some, uh, the, the, the bad decisions that come up. So this is basically one of the, uh, one of the process to support the successful implementation of Ghana's right to information law. Now, the Director of Advocacy and Policy Engagement at the Ghana Center for Democratic Development, CDD Ghana, and a member of the RTI coalition, Kojo Pumpuni Asanti, said the endorsement by the key stakeholders has now given the Judicial Training Institute the green light to go ahead and train judges for the manual. That part of that RTI can really transform our records keeping and management and retrieval systems. Mm and we need to put money, it's, it's really need some resourcing. Mm-hmm. Our current economic situation obviously makes it harder, you know, to kind of push the agenda across institutions. But we might identify certain institutions that are so critical to nation building that we start with them and say, let's resource them so that, you know, it can improve the access to information generally. We had a validation meeting with the judiciary on a judicial training manual on the RTI. I think even when we were fighting for the passage of the bill, one of the things that I think everybody was concerned about was to make sure that judges are apprised with the, the law, they understand where the law is coming from, what its objectives are, its purposes, so that when they are interpreting the law, they have a better grounding of how the law is being applied, not just in Ghana, but internationally. 
So it's come, I mean, we've taken a long time to come to this point, but we had the Judicial Trade Institute here. Uh, we had uh, judges, you know, from uh, different uh, upper and lower courts um, who, who to come and look at the, the manual and to validate it so that it can be used to train judges. Now, the Pension Bondholders Forum says it will resume its picketing at the premises of the Ministry of Finance if the government fails to pay all outstanding coupons and principles of bond investment by April 28, 2023. This, uh, they believe, will put an end to the payment delays. There is more in this report. In a statement signed by its convener, Dr. Edu Anani Inchi, it expressed disappointment about government inconsistency regarding assurance to pay all pensioners their outstanding coupons and principles of bond investment. A press release dated April 14, 2023 from the Ministry of Finance indicated that a meeting held with the leadership of Korea of individual bondholder groups and the Pensioners Bondholders Forum indicated that the Joint Technical Committee constituted on January 18 reconvenes and agrees on the pathway towards the resettlement of the outstanding debt obligations by April 28. However, the Pensioners Bondholders Forum denied that no such decision was reached. It therefore expressed much surprise about the misleading statement contained in paragraph 2 of the Ministry of Finance press release on April 14, 2023. It added that the proposal from the Ministry of Finance that the Joint Technical Committee constituted on January 1 to be given a period of four weeks to work and agree on a pathway towards the settlement of the outstanding debt obligations by government was not accepted. Now, the Rich Church School has established an educational trust fund. The fund is to help construct a senior high school in order to accelerate the provision of quality education to all. Speaking at the launch of the trust fund, the Justice of the Appeals Court, Messi Melik Wood, charged the Board of Trustees to explore innovative ways of raising funds for the school. Joy Prime Shola Adeyemi has more in the following report. Established in 1957 by the benevolence of the Rich Church, the Rich Church School has produced men and women occupying key roles in Ghana and beyond. Over the years, the school has fed top senior high schools with brilliant students. But after 66 years of existence, the management of the school has decided to establish its own senior high school. Speaking at the launch of the trust fund, headmistress of the school, Nana Mabadasu, indicated that the move is part of the institution's five-year strategic plan to become a citadel of academic excellence. We as a school have a five-year strategic plan and in the plan one of the things is to develop our school to maintain the facilities and also build a secondary school and we realized that we can't get the money in bulk and so there was a need to set up a fund that people can donate from time to time so we can have consistency. I'm very excited that it is, this dream has been harnessed for a very long time and I feel excited being part of it to see the dream come into reality. So I'm excited. The establishment of the trust fund will wean the school off the Accra Rich Church while augmenting the government's efforts in providing quality senior high education. As a member of the Rich Church School Board of Governors, Madame Grace Dede Hansen appealed to all stakeholders to help establish a school that is responsive to the needs of the job market. We are saying to the alumni and friends, we need your help. Please come to Rich Church School and help us. Come and help us set up a modern 21st century top senior high school that has STEM as its focus, combining both the national and international curricula at an affordable cost. The Justice of the Appeals Court urged the trustees of the fund to carry their mantles with diligence to help the school achieve its goals. The trustees who have been carefully selected, I'm reminding them of the tenets of accountability, transparency, and keeping the purpose of the trust fund in mind. I charge them to find innovative ways of generating income. All stakeholders have to be given regular 
information. The Rich Chess School Trust Fund is expected to raise about 200,000 Ghana cities as seed money. This will also help upgrade the existing facilities, provide scholarship to deserving learners, and improve academic programs. Lois Adeyemi's report for Joy Prime. Now, Divine Mission Academy has emerged winners of the fourth edition of the Love FM Primary School Quiz. The first time finalists outsmarted 2022 champions Mana International School by a nine point margin to clinch the bragging right as the best primary school in the Ashanti region. Emmanuel Bride Kweku has highlights from the fiercely contested grand finale. Sacrilegious. S A C R I L E G I O U S Sacrilegious. And that is correct for three points. The third contest of the semi-finals of the Love FM Primary School Quiz has been fierce. Contestants of the three participating schools thrilled the audience with a traffic battle of wits. At the end of the contest, Divine Mission Academy came first after beating last year's finalist, Hansi Gold Community School and Amazing Grade School. The contestants of Divine Mission Academy are optimistic of victory in the grand finale. The strategy was that uh, we depended on God, we prayed on God, and we studied hard on all the assignments that they gave us. So, going forward, that is the final stage, you are the first school qualifying. What are we to expect from you in the final stage of the quiz? We are going to win. This time, we are going to take the trophy from Mana International School. It was a tough contest to be very honest some of the questions were jaw dropping but you know we prepared our kids and as the saying goes teamwork makes the dream work and as in the fame of the words of my school director hard work pays and so we worked hard we've put in the work we've done everything we prepared fully for this contest no matter how it challenged us we came out at the top as winners meanwhile Hansi Gold Community School and Amazing Grace Hansi School Gold. are not relenting in coming out strong next year Next year, we are coming to come back with a lot of armor. This time, we were just coming to try it for the second time. But our armors were not tough like that. So next year, when we are coming, we are bringing a lot of armor. You know, every level of this competition gives you another opportunity to learn. And today was really tough. Today, the dimension, the question went, we, we, we were really struggling. So this space um, paves another way for us to study. It opens our eyes to a lot of things to study. We have a lot to study. So what will be your preparation going forward? Obviously, we, we came this, this very um, contest with the mentality to win. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't go our way. We will go back to the drawing board and then do one or two things, correct one or two mistakes, and then come back next year stronger. So this is the Divine Mission Academy School. They have won the semi-final for this one of the FM primary school quiz. They proceed to the final stage of the contest. Would they win the fourth edition of the Love FM primary school quiz? For Joy News, my name is Nana Bwachidang Kweyadom. Away from that, traders at the Aquitia line are up in arms against the Asokari Mampon Municipal Assembly over attempts to pull down their shops for the construction of a new market. After failed attempt in the past seven months for the traders to voluntarily evacuate, the assembly moved to site on Friday to evict the traders. But the exercise was resisted as the traders engaged the police in a confrontation that got too injured. Lava FM's Nanabwachi Yadam has more in the following report. The new market project at Aquatia Line was expected to commence seven months ago, but the traders were not pleased with the resettlement process. Hundreds of traders took to the streets to express their displeasure over the relocation exercise when the project contractor and the municipal assembly visited the site. Secretary of the Traders Association, Mohamed Umuri, says the authorities have failed to secure a permanent place for the traders before the relocation exercise. He accused the police of attacking the protesting traders. The robbers and the police and the langas, there are three categories. They have arrested people to the police station. We called Zongo police station because we took the case there. So they told us they are coming. We will not say they will not develop the country. 
but they should show us where are we to where are we going they should show us the place to vacate umal Seidu alleged he was attacked while protesting I was attacked by the police and the anti-robbers for not doing anything wrong. They hit me with a stick until I got unconscious. Some of the traders say their livelihoods are threatened if the assembly goes ahead with the eviction without alternative space for them to trade. If they evacuate us, things would be difficult because I have children I am taking care of. They have also not given us anywhere to move to. I just heard land guards came here to demolish the place just this morning. I have stayed here for over 60 years. I have over a thousand bags of salt and I don't have anywhere to send them to. You can't sack us without giving us a permanent marketplace. <laughs> Municipal Chief Executive of the Asokori Mampo, Kennedy Kankam, says the Assembly is willing to relocate the traders to a more secured market for the project to begin in phases. DMC pleaded with the traders to comply with the relocation exercise. All what we are trying to do is to rearrange the place so that we will implement the project in phases. So if you finish phase one, we move the people to go and occupy the shops or the or the station or the market that will be will be will be captured in that phase one. From there we move it then to phase two. Then phase two two after phase two then we move the next batch of uh, traders or those who are occupying the place to come and occupy it until we finish the last stage of the project. We are just implementing what they did at the KJTR and the central market. For Joe News, Nana Bwati Dankoyadom reporting. Now, the Food and Drugs Authority has seized unregistered herbal and orthodox medical products in Kumasi. In a market surveillance exercise in the Ashanti region, the authority grabbed illegal pharmaceuticals, including body enhancement products, from a retail market. There is more in this report. The products were seized from a single retail shop at the Alaba market, an identified hotbed for the sale of unwholesome herbal products and drugs. The items included a variety of aphrodisiacs, unregistered herbal products, orthodox pain relievers and cosmetics. Some of the seized products had engraved on them unknown languages, while others were conspicuously sourced from the U.S. John Laie Odai Tete is the Ashanti Regional Head of the Food and Drugs Authority. Um, well, you are witnessing one of the routine exercises FDA carries out across the country. And it's just about the seizure of unregistered products out there in the market. This one was seized in just a single shop at Alaba. And we have a number of them out there. You recall that last week, thereabout, we had a similar exercise. And the Ashanti Regional Office is going to sustain this exercise. We are working with our collaborators, the Ghana Police Service. They have been of immense help. And we're going to ensure that products that are not registered, especially the medicinal products, which are dangerous, would be gotten rid of from the markets. According to the FDA, the seized product will be destroyed through incineration. The authority observed with worry the perpetual penetration of illicit medicinal products on the market. However, the authority says it is mapping the entire region to smoke out perpetrators and bring them to book. Well, um, we do a lot of surveillance, yes, and, and scouting. 
and we are mapping the entire region so that wherever we have these things sold, we'll just move to those areas to get rid of them and to arrest the perpetrators. But we, we have some spots that are perpetually displaying these products and we have started with them. We will get to all the other areas. So um, we want to advise, really, those who are into this kind of illegal trade to rethink their activities because we'll come at them. A growing trend on social media is the sale of these unwholesome products. The FDA is collaborating with the appropriate quarters to rid the internet of the advertisement and sale of such unwholesome products. John Laetete cautions the public against patronage of unregistered products. Visit the hospital and get a prescription. You are not supposed to buy medicines like you buy toffees. No, medicines are sold at designated places. And we expect that pharmacies, over-the-counter medicine shops that are licensed and licensed herbal medicinal product shops are available. And you need to move in there with your prescription, if any. Our communication directorate is also working with those um, advertising agencies to ensure that the appropriate thing is done. However, as we clear them from the market, those who are selling online will have nothing to supply. Already, three persons arrested for similar offences have been arraigned before courts. For Joy News, Emmanuel Bright Kweku reporting. Now to the Bono East region now, where a young artist in the Inkuranza municipality, uh, Mark Pencil, is urging government to establish art studios across the country to hip up interest as well as encourage the youth into venturing in the art trade. An art survey report from an event to mark World Art Day, celebrated to honor the contribution of artists and promote the importance of art in our lives. Art nurtures creativity, innovation and cultural diversity for all peoples across the globe and plays an important role in sharing knowledge and encouraging curiosity and dialogue. These are qualities that art has always had and will always have if we continue to support environments where artists and artistic freedom are promoted and protected. In this way, Federal the development of art also feathers our means to achieve a free and peaceful world. Here in Ghana, public funding for the art sector is virtually non-existent, a situation that continuously hindered the progress of the industry. And even though creative entrepreneurs, through their individual efforts, have created and sustained what looks like a sprawling industry, the lack of structural support remains a major challenge. To help boost public interest in the art sector and save it from dying, the World Art Day was established to encourage greater awareness of the diversity of artistic expressions and highlight the contribution of artists to sustainable development. As we mark this day, I paid a visit to this small kiosk where 20-year-old Mark Pencil is practicing his art trade. I inquired from Mark, an SHS lever, if he's aware of this day. Yeah. That's why I cry. I wasn't new. It's my friend who told me that there, there was a D. Then I searched for it. And when I searched it, I said, oh, it's very nice. It's very nice. And it also yeah, help us. And it can motivate us. So maybe, maybe I, at least a year, we have something we can also do. Uh, Mark attributed a number of reasons to the seeming collapse of the sector and this he says includes the lack of art galleries for upcoming artists to learn from. Uh, in Ghana here we have many talents, we have talented kids who are also growing and they can do better, they can do better. But we have lack of art gallery and art studios so the, the kids are not able to start, from the, their, start their career when they were, they were born. Yeah. He bemoans the struggles upcoming artists are going through, especially those living in the rural communities. We really, really want help from the government because there are also some upcoming kids who can do better in the artwork. And we have lack of art gallery, art studio 
because all these things you can find maybe Accra Oak Massey. Yeah, here are that some small, small village, you can't see anything. Yeah, and the, the kids are also growing from that the same village, but they don't get any help. Mm -hmm. So we want the government maybe he can build maybe something small because he, he also can benefit from it. Mark believes that the establishment of various art competitions in schools would help identify as well as nurture the next generation to venture into the art industry. It will help very very well because it will help the kids to grow in the artwork yeah, very easier. Because maybe for me, when I was a kid, when I see my friend doing the artwork and more beautiful than me, I'll try to do better than him. So it motivates you every time. So you should organize um, maybe art competition, maybe a year when we have maybe two in other places, every places, yeah, they can help the kids very well. And we have maybe we, if they can help maybe some art schools, you know, it can also yeah, produce more kids who can do better. One of Mark's greatest worries has to do with the lack of appreciation of artistic works by the public. In this world, everything is about artwork. Everything is about art. Because the shirt you are wearing, the shoes and the clothing, even the walk, the way you talk is all about artwork. But they don't appreciate it. Yeah, they don't appreciate it. So if the, if the government can help, maybe we have maybe competitions every year. So maybe the winner will come together and maybe challenge the artwork and can also help the kids. Uh -huh. Well, the World Art Day essentially draws attention to the development of art and its links to innovation, its ability to bring about change as well as on earth hidden potential. The day also serves as a timely reminder that art can unite and link societies even in the most difficult circumstances. And as Sabit, Joy News, Nkranza. Now, the executive director of non-government organization uh, Life Again, Saudatu Mohammed, is urging teenage mothers to not to despair after giving birth. She wants these women to rather have a bright look at the future. Correspondent Rafiq Salam has the rest of the story. The 2023 Teenage Mothers Leadership Conference was held on the team Embrace Equity. The conference is being organized by non-governmental organization Life Again and supported by four agencies, namely Department of Gender, National Youth Authority, Action Aid Ghana, and Complementary Education Agency. It afforded the teenage mothers space and platform to share their stories, learn from each other, and listen to some influential duty bearers, especially women in the region. They also had the opportunity of listening to their mentors who once upon a time found themselves in similar situation but did not let their guards down. Founder and Executive Director for Life Again, Saudato Mohammed threw for the light on the work of her outfit. Once they become pregnant, everyone in the society neglects them. Everyone gives them the tag of a bad girl. Everybody feels that once she becomes pregnant, she can't do anything else than get married. We are here to give a second chance to those girls, to prove to society that there are lots of potentials in these girls and they can still do a lot. And that marriage is not an option. Madam Saudotu Mohammed noted that their aim is to create a world where teenage pregnancy is no hindrance to girls' empowerment. We go beyond prevention because we believe that when it comes to fighting and winning the fight against teenage pregnancy, prevention is not enough. So we go beyond prevention to empower victims of teenage pregnancy. Girls who have already become victims of this problem, we don't neglect them. We don't leave them to their own fate because they are still kids. So they are basically children, having children. Speaker after speaker at the conference encouraged the teenage mothers not to be in despair over their current situation, giving them hope of a brighter future. Our main aim is prevention. But in the process of prevention, if we are not able to prevent and some of our girls fall into it, what do we do? That is where the re-entry concept or guideline policy came in. When you fall and 
you lie on your comfortable zone, you will never come out. The color is say, telling us that we need to act. And you only act when you know what you want to do. When you know your subject matter, you act, you speak. My major issue is that all of you should not say that I'm going to learn a vacation. I want this group, some of you, after today, to tell me that you are interested in going back to school to continue your education. A total of 120 teenage mothers have so far benefited from the program. 15 of them are back to school, a majority of them are into skills training, notable weaving, soap making, and batik tie and die. Annabelle Wogona was 16 years in a junior high school when she became pregnant, thus incurring the wrath of the parents threatened to suck her from their home. My father insulted me, saying all manner of things. She told me that I'll, he will send me out of his house. And during this time, she asked me who impregnated me, and I told him. Um, we called the man, he denied the pregnancy, and I don't know what to say again. And my father told me I'll be out of her, his house. And he told my mom. My mom was very angry, saying all manner of things. She let her head of life again and quickly contacted them for their support. They came and they helped us how to make shower gel, soap, asthma blows, BF, and the rest. And I gave, and I gave birth. Despite the setback, Annabelle still has a dream of going back to school. My stepmother told me when I was pregnant, she would take the baby whilst I will go back to school. Before I deliver, she said he cannot take me, he cannot take the child so that I can go to school. So now, I don't know what to do, I'm confused. Whether I will go back to school or I will go back, but I believe I can go back to school. Our interaction with the teenage mothers indicates that the girls of them want to go back to school. They are about upon supporting families unwilling to serve as caretakers in their absence. Again, we cannot do it all. In Annabelle's situation, we have the finance to support her to go to school. But life again, we cannot take the baby. So we are just calling out on parents, please and please, let's support these girls. Let's help. As we, as we are here, life again, trying to support this girl financially, let's also give them the little support we have. Help with the baby so that they can go back to school. That's why we draw the curtains on today's edition of the Joy News Room with me, Razak Musbao. But up next is the law with Samson Ladi Ayenini. And we'll be exploring between the law, fact and truth, what really decides your case in court. Please do stay.